Okay, good morning and God bless you. I just wanted to get this in before we started class. I know I went on a bit last week, both before class and before the sermon uh, about Memorial Day. But it's not often, well, it's only every seven years, I guess, that the anniversary of D-Day falls on a Sunday. So since we're here, and this is that date, the largest scale military operation in the history of mankind. And uh, to think of the terror, to think of the sacrifice that was made on this day 77 years ago, and, you know, a lot of these troops that, uh, that's Eisenhower, right, that, uh, that he spoke to, you know, went on and died later, uh, I think that same day uh, he spoke to him. And uh, it's pretty sobering. But I tell you, I'm not in the best of moods. I'm joyful and thankful that we're together here on the Lord's Day. But, you know, I'm sick to death of hearing how terrible America is and how much we hear all the time about the negative things in our history. Certainly we need to acknowledge those things, but I fear we have a generation raised that does not realize the tremendous force for good that America has been in the history of the world in delivering tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people from tyranny and the great sacrifice of blood and treasure that has been paid and it's just something we need to remember and try to appreciate and try to raise up a generation that appreciates it that seems to have forgotten it but of course uh, we're here because of the ultimate sacrifice made in our behalf and if you if you don't care for an image like that um, sometimes people prefer where you don't really see what someone believed Jesus looked like. But well, why don't we just use this one here, this kind of abstract cross as we uh, pray together. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Dear God, our great God in heaven, God most high, God almighty, we humble ourselves in your presence. And we offer you our praise. We're thankful that you are our God and that we can call upon you as our Father. And so, Abba, Father, we come to you to offer you our thanks and to ask for your blessings on our, our study, on our worship, on our teachers and our children and your faithful servants here and throughout the world on this Lord's Day, this day our Savior rose from the dead. We thank you once again for the great sacrifices that have been made by others that we might have the liberty to meet like we are this morning and that many others are free as well because of the great good that has been done in our history by those who went before us and even those who are sacrificing even now, Father. But we're mindful above all of the sacrifice of your Son and the ultimate price he paid for our spiritual liberty, for the ultimate freedom, so that we can be free indeed, Father. We rejoice in that and praise you for it and ask that you'd forgive us when we take that for granted. Forgive us, Father, when we fail to live in keeping with it. Please accept our thanks and praise, Father, for in the name of Jesus we ask all of these things. Amen. Okay. Thank you. So here we are in Romans 5, and I've framed what we're looking at a number of ways, but Romans chapter 5, really the reason once again we're sort of pausing, really digging in, looking carefully, is this is the heart of Paul's argument that he is making about how the gospel is God's power to save because it reveals the righteousness of God. And so he has talked about what Jesus has done to give us that righteous status, that right standing with God. And now here, in what's happening in chapter 5 is he talks about the reality of that gift. He calls it here the gift of righteousness. Let me adjust this for just a second. 
he talks about the, uh, the reality of that, that now because of what Christ has done, we have peace with God, all of that that we looked at. But now what we're, what we're phasing into is now the greatness of it, that what Jesus did, as we pointed out already, is more than sufficient to cover the consequences of sin brought into this world by Adam sin and death. So that's the focus here. And in our class last time, we, we said this text is a tremendously important one in New Testament theology and biblical theology because it is considered to be a principal passage, if not the principal text, that teaches the doctrine of original sin or inherited sin or total depravity, Augustine, Augustine, or sometimes he's called saint, though we know the, the Bible uses the word saint of all Christians. But in church history, St. Augustine, uh, that's how I usually say it, Augustine. But um, he argued that uh, what Paul is saying here is that we're all born totally depraved in sin. And so we talked about the far-reaching consequences of that. If that's your starting point for understanding human nature and our condition and sin, that we're completely depraved and utterly incapable of responding unless God changes us by a miraculous, uh, by, a, by a supernatural regeneration. Uh, if that's your starting point, see, that has very uh, far-reaching implications, even to the point of, of that's what is ultimately behind, of course, infant baptism and also, uh, which is unbiblical, uh, and also uh, this idea that you can't lose your salvation. Because in this view, you have really nothing to do with your salvation. It's all on God's part. Monergism, mono, that it's all God, that it's just one. God, not synergism, where it's God does His part, and then our part is to freely respond to it. No, God makes, God chooses those who will, He will make respond to it. And so from beginning to end, it's all God's action. All of that stems from a misunderstanding, I believe, of this text and other passages in the New Testament. Now, I want you to think about this because I'm not going to do so much verse-by-verse -verse analysis here except to, to note a few things, read through it, and then su kind of summarize it, and then I'll try to open it up to your own questions and thoughts here, because I'm struggling a little bit with uh, between two views here uh, of understanding this particular, two different ways, the way I've understood it in the past, but I'm kind of leaning toward a, a different perspective on it right now, so I'd be interested to see what the class thinks of it. But first I want you to think about something, uh, uh, how to frame this whole uh, discussion. Uh, Augustine talked about something that we refer to as the four states of man. So I want you to think about man's condition before the fall. All right, then what changed once sin came into the world? After the fall, after sin entered the world. And then what changes when you become a Christian, when you are saved or get saved, as we often say, that sounds a little bit crude, but, but, but that's the idea. Once you are, and the way Calvinists or those in the Reformed tradition would refer to it as regeneration, once we're born again, and that language is used, Titus 3, 3 through 5, the idea of reborn, new birth, being generated or born again. All right, what, what changes then? And then what's it going to be like in heaven after we're glorified? Are you able right now not to sin? Right? You, it, it's possible for me to resist temptation, right? I, it's possible for me not to sin. Um, what about those who are not, quote, regenerate, or those who are not regenerated, those who are not born again, who are not in a saved relationship with God? Is it possible for people outside of Christ not to sin? If we're, if we're going to say that before you're born again, it's impossible for you 
not to sin, then how could you be held accountable for it if you're not free to do other than what you do? See, this is, that, that, that's the idea of determinism, that what you do is determined and you cannot help but do what you do. Now think of these categories here. This will make sense in a minute because this gets to a difficult question about heaven. Well, will we, will we, will we be able to sin in heaven? And if not, will we still be free moral agents if it's impossible for us to sin in heaven? All right, so we start before the fall, and we're going to use our Latin here, okay? I know this really, uh, this makes Rose very happy. But uh, have you heard the term peccadillo before? Peccadillo, some, it's a, used to refer to, it's from the Latin word peccare. Um, uh, that's a form of the term from which we get peccadillo, meaning a fault. It's generally used as a fault that's thought of as minor. Um, for example, you might say, well, you know, my wife puts up with some of my peccadillos. You know, I, I uh, uh, don't, I, 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 I leave my clothes on the floor, someone might say, and a lot of times I don't shut the refrigerator door or something. But, you know, and a lot of times I interrupt or I talk too much, but my wife's very patient with my peccadillos. That's, that's the kind of thing it's used to refer to. Those are purely hypothetical. I never leave the refrigerator door open or my clothes on the floor. I'm just thinking of some hypothetical situation as far as you know. So uh, peccadillo, well, th that's, that's uh, from this word peccare, which means to sin, to err, okay? So um, that, that will help you to understand the Latin terms that I think are useful here. So before the fall, when God made man, and so he presented man with the choice to obey him or reject him in the garden. So in that situation, man was able to sin, but he was able not to sin, right? When God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Were they capable of resisting that temptation? Yes, they could have not sinned. So able to sin is the, the Latin posse pecare, pecare for sin, posse able. Able not to sin means posse non pecare, able not to sin. Now, what happened though when sin entered the world? That's what Paul's going to talk about here. And this is where now I think the perversion and the misunderstanding comes in. Because it's argued then that after the fall, man is now not able not to sin. That, see, Paul's telling us here now, we're all sinners by nature. So that once Adam sinned and brought sin and death into the world, we all inherit, and, and in church history, there was all this discussion about how is that inherited depravity passed on? And some argued it was through procreation, and that's why some people incorrectly think of sex as the original sin. Have you ever heard that? That, you know, the original sin is what happened in the garden. But uh, I've heard some who've misunderstood Christian, that they believe that the Christian view is that sex is the original sin. That's a grossly uh, incorrect idea. But, but that's because there was this effort to try to figure out, well, how is it passed on and all of that? Not able, not to sin. So that would mean non posse, not able, non pecari. Uh, not able, not to sin. Non posse, non pecari. Now, but then when you're saved, you're back to the situation like we had in the garden. We can still sin, and we do. We do still sin. We're still capable of sinning. So we still, are, uh, still have the posse... Bacare, but we can also resist sin by, it's argued, by the help of the Holy Spirit now that we have been redeemed. And I do think Paul teaches in Romans chapter 8, we do have the help of the Holy Spirit to resist sin, but it's, it's argued that now um, we, we are posse Bacare and posse non bacare again, back in the garden, able to sin, able not to sin. So you see the step here that is of concern to us is right here, where you're thinking that because of the fall, you see now 
we cannot help but sin. And then what's it going to be like in heaven? In heaven, it's argued, we'll be not able to sin. Non posse peccari. Is that true? Is it true that in heaven it will be impossible to sin? This is difficult because if God could make us free to lovingly serve Him and obey Him and yet not sin, why didn't He make it like that from the beginning? Why didn't He make us free and incapable of sinning? I think that's actually a contradiction. I don't think you are truly free unless, you, unless it is possible for you to do other than what you do, right? If you're in a situation where you cannot help but do what you do, then, then you're not acting freely. And we don't hold people accountable who are, are that way. And sometimes people try to argue in court that they could not help but do what they did because of mental illness or some other uh, factor that operated on them in such a way as they were forced to do what they did. Uh, and, and more and more people seem to get away with that defense. But um, we hold people accountable on the assumption that they could choose to do other than what they do, right? So in heaven, I don't know if I want to say that in heaven it will be impossible for us to sin, but I, I would just say we won't sin. We'll be able not to sin. And it seems to me, and I'm speculating a little here, but... Uh, in heaven, when we're actually in the presence of God, when we're actually experiencing directly the glory of God in the heavenly state, that we, we will no longer have any desire to sin, right? Does, does that make sense? Don is nodding his head. I feel like I'm on solid theological ground. See, I, it, it, is, it, is a, uh, it is a difficult question, but... Um, I think the idea is, again, in heaven, that our wills will be so aligned with God's that, um, that even though it would be technically possible to sin, we won't sin because of the conditions being so different. Well, why didn't God make those conditions now? So that no one would sin and we wouldn't have people lost forever and we wouldn't have all the suffering of sin and death? Well, be because we do need to have a time where, we, uh, where we're tempted so that we can uh, be tested. I think the point of our existence in this life is to be a proving ground or a testing ground whether we obey God. And then in heaven, that, that testing won't be necessary and we won't experience that. Does that make sense as well? So that's why I think God didn't just make it like heaven from the start. Uh, so th that, that's, again, though, some speculation on my part about the glor glorified state. But this is, it. now as we look at the text, this is the problem here, right here, that we're, that we're dealing with. So to frame it once more, remember the importance of understanding. Paul isn't here teaching us uh, that we inherit depravity. He's trying to increase our confidence in the fact that what Jesus did on the cross not only compensates for the sin and death that is in the world, but in more, much more. Remember, we notice how that term comes up over and over and abounded. He uses this kind of language to show that it more than compensates. And so the point is, uh, in Adam, we said we experience death. We are under condemnation. That's true. And in some sense, we're made sinners. That's what we're going to look at. But this is important, and I think this is why I'm leaning toward the view now that I want to present to you, that whatever the whole human race gets because of Adam, in this text, Paul said, that has been completely canceled or overcome for the whole human race by Christ. That doesn't mean everyone's going to be saved. So let's say that Paul is teaching here that because of Adam's sin, all of us are under the condemnation of sin. It doesn't matter because what Jesus did on the cross canceled that out for everyone. So that all that you and I need to worry about now is our personal sin. That's, that's the view that I want you to consider.
But it is a lot to consider. What I didn't get in last time is when, when, when the passage starts, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, okay? Sin came into the world through one man and death. Whoops. So death came into the world through sin. Well, what kind of death? You can think of death, physical death. James 2.26, the body apart from the spirit is dead. So at physical death, that's not the end of our existence. It's the temporary separation of the body and the spirit, physical death. Well, but also spiritual death. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, and other passages talk about being in, living in uh, the state of rebellion against God and in, in a state of disobedience. Spiritual death, spiritual separation from God. And then eternal death, the final consequences of that, we're finally and fully and eternally separated from God. That's called the second death, Revelation 20, in verse 6 and in verse 14. Well, what is Paul talking about here when he says death came into the world through sin? Remember God told Adam and Eve, uh, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, they did eat, but they didn't die that day physically, did they? That's why a lot of people argue that, well, it was spiritual death and then the consequences, physical death came later. Uh, I think God showed grace uh, and allowed them to continue to live, but ultimately they did die. So they began to die that day because they lost, right? They lost access to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So really even physically, they did die that day. They entered into a state leading to death physically, but there was also a spiritual need uh, as well. So there was a spiritual separation. So it seems to me, uh, Paul, we have to think now as we go through this text, uh, are, there, are there times when he's talking about both physical and spiritual, or is he talking just about physical death? See, I think that's another area where people misunderstand. Now, what I said is that I think um, that Paul is saying here when he says all sin. Now, this is where the big debate is. Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. And as I said, I used to read that as, well, we all, what Paul is saying is, uh, we all die because like Adam, we also all sin. But, but, this is, the, the, this is the point here. Death spread to all men because all sin. I think the idea is, though, it's connected to Adam. It's not just saying, well, I'm going to die too. Because like Adam, I sin too. That's the way I used to look at this verse. And it does, I think that's not an unreasonable way to understand it. But Paul's saying there's a sense in which I die because of what Adam did. So I sinned in Adam. Now, see, be careful here because I'm not arguing for original sin. But I think the idea he's trying to say, think of what Christ did. See, Christ, what Jesus did counters this. So that's, that's important then. What is it that Christ countered? What is it that he made, that he did to, to overcome this? Or what is it that he overcomes, rather, by what he did? All right, so there's union with Adam in a way that we were in Adam's loins, all the human race, similar to Hebrews 7, talking about um, uh, Levi be, paying tithes to the Melchizedek just by the sense that he was in Abraham's loins. He was a descendant of Abraham. So Adam was acting, some would say, as our federal head. He's acting as the representative of all mankind. So in that sense, we all get death because of what Adam did. Now, if, if that's the approach we take, that doesn't, we don't want to say, therefore, what Jesus did on the cross gives all spiritual or eternal life. Because we know not everybody's going to be saved. What I think then this means in this view that I sinned in Adam, I, we have all sinned in Adam, represented in Adam, I think what that means is what Jesus did on the cross then, therefore, delivers us from that, but we still have our own personal sin, see, 
that will separate us from God eternally if we don't respond. So it takes more than what Jesus did on the cross in the sense that I'm, there's an effect of Jesus' death that, that all men receive, but then the benefits of his saving righteousness, that requires a response from my, on my part. That's the sense in which I mean that. Okay, so if, if you're not thoroughly confused, uh, then you're not paying attention. So, John, are, are we all confused? Help me. Help me! Okay. Okay, okay, so... So we lost access to the tree of life, right? Yes. One, one Adam sin. So we all lost access, though, right? Not, the point is not just Adam, but we all have lost something because of Adam. Right? Okay, that's what I'm getting at. But by the way, if you make a comment, that's how you make a comment. Well, I could hear you all the way down here. I don't think I even have to repeat it. I think they could hear it. But uh, Okay, I think when I lay out in a chart here, this whole passage here in a moment, I think that will, that will line up with what I'm getting to, John. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, let's... let's, let's Bear with me. Let's just keep going. So verse 13. For indeed sin was in the world before the law. Now he's bringing up the law because remember in the Jewish idea, all we need is the law to deal with our problem of sin. But he's saying, look, sin was already in the world before the law. And when the law came along, it didn't deliver everyone <laughs> from sin. Again, the point Paul has been making since chapter 2 and 3, really, especially in chapter 3, and then on into chapter 4, he's been arguing at length. Uh, justification has to be received through faith. It's an obedient faith, but not on the basis of the works of the law. So, so here he says for, I think he's anticipating uh, objections, and the language is very compressed. He's dealing with thinking that maybe is a little bit foreign to us. We don't, maybe don't realize some of the assumptions he's trying to address here, and that's what makes some of it difficult. But notice, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin's not counted where there is no law. <clears throat> Yet death reigned, and this is going to fit with the, the sermon this morning. Death reigned. This word reign, he's going to use that a couple of times, and it's going to go right into chapter 6 when he talks about what happens after baptism. How now... Sin no longer reigns over us. So he's saying though, see, that's what Christ made, made possible, to break the yoke of sin, to defeat the power of sin so we're no longer under the reign or the rule so it doesn't, doesn't dominate us. I'm going to talk about all that in the sermon, all the language of the sermon spilling out of me right now. So when I start preaching, you can just leave uh, later. But <clears throat> So notice, uh, let me see if I can... Uh, notice then he says, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin's not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So this is where he's, why he's introducing Adam. He introduces Adam, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 15 to make contrast with Christ as well, dealing with the resurrection, mainly with the resurrection, not so much with sin, but to talk about the idea of death coming in the world through Adam and then life through Christ. But here he's talking about, though, the sin that produced the death. So let me put it, let me frame it this way. He's, here's the timeline, okay, from Adam to Moses, from Moses to Christ. That's when the law came in, right? So the law came in under Moses. And what Paul is arguing here is though, but even before the law was given, sin was reigning during that time. So people were still under law, right? And I'm giving some passages here. They were still under law. Paul argued back in chapter 2, even those before the law of Moses and the Gentiles outside of Israel 
they have the law written in their hearts. So everyone has a basic sense of right and wrong, a moral awareness because we're made in the image of God. And so uh, Paul argues uh, that in chapter 4, verse 15, where there is no law, there's no transgression. And you remember he starts by saying the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men. And he talks about the Gentiles. They were accountable to God. They were under law. So I think the, the point is that the law didn't fix the problem of sin. That sin was already reigning, there was already moral law, then God comes along and gives positive law to Israel. Moral law becomes encoded in the commandments. And what that did, if Paul's going to argue in chapter 7, is what that did is it, it just made sin even more sinful. And it actually led to more sin in the sense that now there were more things you could violate and, become, and actually magnify the amount of your sin. And so it actually, Paul, in, in a sense, argues that it actually produced sin in me. He said, the law produced sin in me. And I started doing what I didn't want to do. So that's a very difficult discussion that's in Romans chapter 7. Very challenging. But that I think the idea is that, that the law didn't fix the problem of sin. Let, let's see. You'll see what I mean as we, as we go further. In fact, as we go further, notice he says that Adam was a type, a type. That's that word tupas, right? It's the term, maybe you've heard sermons on this or lessons on this, that refers to the um, impression left by, by a tool. And so you have the impression that bears the image of the instrument. So you have the impression, but then you have the real thing that made the impression. So the impression isn't the real thing. It just looks like the real thing. So, so we know the Old Testament, the, the typology of Scripture, that the Old Testament is full of types. Like the, the sacrificial lamb was a type of Christ. Jesus was the true lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. But see, so much of the New Testament ha has to be understood in the typology that the things in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, we're representing Christ. Baptism is uh, an anti-type. The type is, Paul, or rather Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, the type was Noah. In, the, in the, the time of the flood, God used water to bring Noah from the old sinful world to a new state. And he said, that's a type of... See, there's something about that that figures or pictures. It symbolizes... What, G, what happens, rather, in baptism, when water, through that ritual involving water, you're brought into a new existence. So in this way, Adam, in a similar way, Adam, there's something about Adam that, where you can make a comparison to Christ. Well, what is the comparison he's making here? I think it's this. Just as by Adam, only one man, by a single act, he affected all of mankind, brought sin and death, and all of the heartache and misery and destruction that now is in our fallen world, that even innocents, even children, even, even uh, uh, babies, even those who are not accountable to sin, suffer because of our fallen world. Well, Adam introduced that whole state to the world. He's the head of mankind. It falls upon him as the head of the human race. So by a single act, so Jesus Christ, by one man through his, what he calls his act of righteousness, his obedience, meaning his suffering on the cross, he also then affected all of mankind and made possible uh, for us to escape the consequences of Adam's, uh, or of our own sin. All right, so let's look at, let's read the text, and then we'll, I'm going to put these comparisons up here before you. All right, so look at, he's going to say uh, he's like, Christ, but different from Christ. So often, just like the high priest was a type of Christ, so Jesus was like the high priest in some senses, but then in the book of Hebrews, it's very important to know, notice the ways, though, though, that Christ is different from the high priest. Jesus didn't have to have any uh, atonement for his own sin like the high priest did, and he did not 
uh, take the blood of, an, of another into the holy place. He, he went with his own blood. So both the similarities are important, but the contrast. So look at this. He says, verse 15, But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died, and many here is used of essentially all, okay? Just, you know, all people, that, that is a lot of people. That, that it, all people do constitute many people. <laughs> So he doesn't mean not everybody, but just many, many people. It means essentially in this context, it's used interchangeably with all, I think, for the most part. So he says, for if many died through one man's trespass, now here's the point he's making, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of God of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because, let me move this up, if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life. See, there's a change in what is ruling both the world, but our personal lives, ultimately, through one man, Jesus Christ. So verse 18, therefore, just as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one... Now, here's the, here's the difficult passage here. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you thought the rest was difficult already, <laughs> look at this one. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. See, that's why I said what I did earlier, that I don't think Paul was just saying, okay, well, through one man's sin came into the world, verse 12, and now we all die because like Adam, we all sinned. Here he's saying, by his disobedience, there's some sense in which we've all been made sinners. That's where I think you get this idea of total depravity, inherited uh, depravity and all of that, uh, original sin, all that stuff we were talking about. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now, the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That's the important point to keep in view here. So that as sin, he said earlier, death reigned, but really the, the sting of death is sin, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. So as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, let, let's look at it like this. On the one side, the, the disobedience of Adam versus the obedience of Christ. So I have the verses listed here, all right? Look at these first set of, of contrasts. One man's trespass. Notice the language is going to be trespass, disobedience, sin. And then over here I've highlighted what Jesus did is called grace. It's called free gift. It's called an act of righteousness. All of that refers to the same thing, what happened on the cross. So, one man's by one man's trespass, many died, verse 15. I'm, do, I'm looking at it this way now. And then we look across. But by the grace of one man, by the free, the free gift abounded for many. Okay? What's the next, what's the next uh, set here? Wait. One trespass led to condemnation. The free gift led to justification. One man's trespass by one man's trespass, death reigned, but by one man, the abundance of grace, the free gift of righteousness will reign in life. So each time it's countered by what Jesus did. All right, the next, the next set of comparisons. Let me scroll this up. Just wanted you to see them sort of put side by side like this. One trespass led to condemnation for all. One act of righteousness justification and life for all. One man's disobedience made us sinners. 
but by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And I have Philippians 2.8 there because Paul used that language of what Jesus did on the cross. He became obedient, obedient, even unto death, the death of the cross. So what Jesus did on the cross is viewed in terms of his absolute submission to the will of the Father. So it's obedience, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Because then when we get into ne to the next chapter, Paul's going to say, now Christ has broken the bonds of sin, and now we're to obey righteousness. We're to have a different master that we serve. Uh, so the idea of whom we obey. And then finally now, this last set. What happened... Through the one, sin increased. The law came in, and it actually magnified that. Sin increased, but grace abounded. See, that's, that's a really good point to see the contrast here. And then sin reigned in death, but grace will reign in righteousness through eternal life. Now, this is what I hurriedly set before you in class at the end of class last time. But let me put that summary up again. Think of, you have the consequence of Adam's sin, but we also need to realize, see, I think that's why even infants die. There's a sense in which even infants and children and people who are not mentally capable of, of making moral choices, how, how they still are sinners in the sense that they still die in Adam. But, oh, no, 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 but don't worry, because Christ canceled that out. So that they're not going to be held spiritually liable for that. So, but we still have the consequences of our personal sins. So the point that Paul is making was this. If Christ's sacrifice more than cancels out the consequences of Adam's sin, then it is more than enough to cancel out the consequences of our own sin, of my personal sin. And it, that doesn't happen automatically, this was unconditional and universal. And what Jesus did canceled out the universal effects of Adam's sin. But when it comes to my personal sin, that's not going to automatically be canceled out. That's limited to those who respond to the conditions of salvation, who respond, as Paul argues, in faith. So that's very important. So I know the bell rang, but th this is where we're going in the sermon then. See all the time I gave you to dispute my view or to ask questions for clarification or make comments? I did this perfectly so that uh, I could just drop the mic and walk off or actually run away with my tail between my legs. But so what he gets to now then is how in this next section, one of the most thrilling sections of Scripture, Romans 6, 7, and 8, and there's going to be this crescendo when we get to the end of chapter 8 that is absolutely thrilling. But this whole new section we move into now is how God's righteousness, this free gift of grace through the propitiating, the propitiating sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it gives us victory over sin. So now he's going to answer some objections about grace, law, and sin. Uh, what does all this mean? That's what we'll start to look at in the sermon this morning. So uh, I know that was a lot, but thank you for letting me at least set it out there for your consideration. I'd be happy to talk to you if you have any questions or comments about that.